uh, the dress that I'm wearing here was made by a fellow Kama member called Hamish Abukari. What she said, she said to me, oh, you're going to score forum. I want to make sure that you're looking appropriate for that forum. So I'm going to make a dress. So Kama is Comfort Alumni Network. On Thursday, the 2nd of July, 1998, I found myself in a room with 400 other young women who had been educated through school and supported by Comfort. And Comfort stands for Campaign for Female Education. They'd supported us through school with a bursary. So as we stood in there, we had come together to celebrate this huge fit. We are amongst the first in our villages to have gone that far. And so this was a huge feat to celebrate. But we're also there to talk about, so what's next? We were daunted by the future. Just the idea of what's next. Because Comfort works in the most remote rural districts, where even the ministries of education rarely go to, and are even aware of as much as their schools. So for us, there were no jobs that we could see. We're not just daunted because we didn't really think we didn't have an imagination. And you didn't really need an imagination to know what would become of you. We knew what was going to happen. Because when we got back to our villages, girls were still dropping out of school. Children were still leaving out of school prematurely because they couldn't afford the cost. Challenges of child marriage, challenges of teenage pregnancy. But look here, everybody in our community was celebrating us. We're the heroines. Girls had made this huge brag. But we were conflicted. Because we knew, we knew what we were going to become. I recall sitting there in that room when young woman after young woman, when girl after girl was walking up and talking about their stories. I remember thinking, did they steal my, my, my script? Because that really sounds like me. And it was the first time that we had met together. We were not aware that there were 400 of us across the country. So, just sitting there and realizing from that proximate distance that my story wasn't unique. I wasn't the only one with monopoly on poverty and how it affects women. There was a shared story and a shared narrative in this room. So it wasn't, it wasn't easy. I remember sitting there and looking at one of the girls who was there, Emma. She was wearing this dress and I was like, if only I had that dress. And please stop judging me, I can see that judging look. <laughs> So I was, I was thinking, if only I had that dress. It wasn't new. It was a faded dress. It was too big for her. But her aunt had given it to her to come to that meeting. I had come to that meeting wearing my uniform because I had nothing else decent to wear. So you see why this dress matters to me? So, so you know, just, just looking at her and feeling envious. But, you know, before I really got to settle down about my entitlement to feeling envious and justified to feel like that, then Tenda I spoke. Tendai, from the day she left secondary school, a teacher had taken her in because her only surviving grandmother had passed away. And to be honest, I was ashamed of myself. So I was vacillating between feeling sorry for myself and empathy, when all of a sudden, there was commotion. We were 400 of us in this room, a room like twice the size of this room. And this man stormed into the room. He was big, and this is relative as well to my size. So he, he stormed into the room, and this man was shouting. He was very well dressed. He looked like he had money, seriously. But he was shouting. And he was shouting to one of the girls in the room, how dare you ignore me? I've been calling you and you're not listening to me. Do you know that you are nothing without me? The clothes that you're wearing and now all of a sudden, you, I own you. And so when I say come, you come. I, I recall feeling outraged. You know when you've got a knot in your throat, but you feel so powerless to challenge this person. And everybody else in the room was recognizing the injustice of it all. And so one of the young facilitators was in the room stood up and said, look here, sir, you have no right to do that. If you're going to ask this girl to get out, you need to do that through your friends. Long story short, everybody in that room found their voice. They were shouting, they were screaming, they were stamping their food. Some of us were big stood up. And everyone was like, no, no, you, you can't ask her out. After all, do you realize that she's a minor? So some of them tried to appeal to the law. Some of them said, actually, she's old, you know, she's young enough to be your daughter. And others were saying, no, but to be honest, whatever you gave it doesn't matter. What is it? Can, can we raise it and give it back to you? But just to say that for me, sitting in that room, when the whole morning we were having a pity party 
about where we were at and how terrible our lives were. And to sit there and see this room with 400 young women standing up to this hefty, well-dressed, and looking very educated men, and saying to him, you're not going to do this as long as we're all here, made me realize our collective power. It made me realize that we might not have the money at that time. We might not have been as educated, you know. Most of us had not gone you know, to university at that time. And we didn't have even the money to be able to match his. But we were together, the 400 of us. And if he was going to do anything, he had to go through us. So on that very day, that's when we started Kama, our Comfort Alumni Network. We said we're going to be together. We're going to be there for each other. We're going to support each other through anything. We're going to go back to our communities and use our voices to make everybody understand that you might not have the money, but you've got a lot more that you've got. And we also say that actually, no, they have catapulted us into leadership positions. All of a sudden, we are pest setters, trend setters. We're going to use this leadership position, this position of influence to be purposeful role models in our community. And in that meeting, they elected me to become their very first national chairperson. So I, I had no option. I had to step up my game as much as I really thought initially I was the one who was supposed to be feeling sorry for myself more. So for me, everybody says to me, what are the three things that you would tell to any entrepreneur? I'll say three things. Number one, just start. When we started this whole Comfort Alum Alumni Network, it didn't have a name. But one thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to be able to go back and change what we had seen happening with what we had, with what we knew, with who we were at that time, at that moment. We're not going to wait another day longer. So just start. Don't wait until you've crossed every T and dotted every I. Start. What you have and what you know and who you know is enough. Start. No excuses. The second thing, partner. There are some people that you would think, actually, this is the time for you to settle old scores with. If you're still trying to settle old scores, you don't care enough. You realize that this is not about you. This is about bigger issues at stake. So you will partner. You will partner with some people that you don't really think very well of because your passion should be able to override any inconveniences that you've got, which is, gets me to the third point. Be willing to learn and be able to face criticism. Know that actually you don't know everything. You don't know everything, and you need to be able to learn. Be open to having your truth as you know it challenged. And most importantly, know that you, you are enough and you can do it. So karma has always been about getting close to our problems, getting close to our challenges, and realizing that actually we could, and we have done that. Thank you. Awesome. So, you know, two questions for you. The first is, and you give this, this gorgeous example, right, of, um, how do you honor where you're from? Do you, how, do you, how do you respect your culture and yet challenge it at the same time? Because I think this is something a lot of our entrepreneurs face, and I'm wondering if you have a thought on that. Definitely. I would say that the Comfort Alumni Network, the young women that I'm representing today, by the way, we rose from 400 members that day to 120,000 members today. So, and... <laughs> So as, as I stand here and talk to you, Fiona, who is now a lawyer, said to me that we'll be cheering and singing and dancing. So I can hear that in the background. So I'm going to tell you like a very brief short story. She's showing me one minute, but I come from Africa. So as long as the sun is out, we're fine. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to tell you about Fatima. Fatima is 19 years old now. She told me this story three weeks ago. So Fatima comes from rural Malawi. So she went to the traditional leader who are the cultural custodians in a community. She's 19. She was supported through school by Comfort from Form 1. She had dropped out three times before Comfort supported her. So she said to me, she went to the traditional leader and said, you know, Mafumo, that's the local name for traditional leader. I'm, I'm not very happy about what's happening to women in my community. The number of girls who are dropping out of school, you know, the challenges that we continue to face, I think the things we need to change. And he said to him, look here, baby girl, small girl, eh? Small girl. Look here, you were born when we were doing this. Your father, I can guarantee you, was born when we were doing this. Your father's father, your great-grandfather. And you are just a small girl. You know, you are a baby. How can you tell me what to do? And she said, okay, I agree with you. You have been doing this all this time. 
And yes, my father, Sada, my grandfather, and everybody else before me have seen you do this. And she said, but I, I, I don't think that this works. And he said to her, aren't you a teacher? You are now a teacher, a qualified teacher, right? Would you have become a teacher if this was not working? And so, Fatima, long story short, she said to him, look here, sir, if I showed you the scars that I have got and the wounds that I have got for just trying to get through the barriers that are in this community for women, you would be shocked. But unfortunately, it's not physical. It's emotional, it's psychological, it's the torture that I go through to become who I am right now. So, and say, all respect, but you're not a woman. I'm a girl, so I understand this problem here better than you. So he said, okay, fine, that's your point. Can I listen to you? Well, they spoke for a long time, and she said to him, this is how I've become a teacher. And she even said, that's why you don't have as many teachers, because you need to realize that some of the things that we are doing here is not really working. Now, you know what happens? So the chief said, all the other traditional leaders, please come. Next time you are going to have a discussion about how to support girls, how to work with women, make sure Fatima is there. She's now our teacher, not just for the children, but also for us. So for me, yes, with respect, with respect, and when you've got the bottom line, which is the red line, yeah. that actually this is not right, you can find your way to turn somebody who is a potential um, distractor yeah. to a champion. It works. Oh. <laughs> uh, if, you close, if you close your eyes at night and you see the most beautiful dream of all girls in Africa being educated, what happens in Africa that doesn't happen now? Oh, please don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> all right. By the way, I, I need to also state that that man that walked on stage that day, it was his kid. He was brought in to be able to assist us to reflect on what we thought was a barrier and how, you know, on the fact that we felt weak when we're not really weak. So it worked that he used that. So you asked me my dream for Africa. I need to close my eyes. Um, I've always said that Zimbabwe is my birthplace. Africa is my home. And the world is my village. I, I believe passionately in the power of education because it changed my life totally. If I told anybody I would be in this room speaking in English on this stage, they would have sent me to the psychiatric unit. <laughs> so I'm, I'm standing here and my, my vision for Africa, let me just use that because it's also the vision for the organization that I work for, for the vision for Kama, because I believe with every every iota of my born in that, in that vision. Our vision is a world in which each and every child is educated, protected, respected, valued, and can grow up to turn the tide of poverty, unashamedly and unapologetically. That's, that's my vision for Africa. Thank you.